and ask them vocally. But if you don't want to forget them, post them in the chat. We will keep up with them and we will try to revisit them. And if you feel like we're going to miss it, then once we get to the discussion point, just remind us you had a question or, you know, feel free to ask it vocally. Uh, those are the main things that I have as far as housekeeping goes. We'll begin tonight with uh, Ms. Valencia Abbott. Um, I've been made more aware of her uh, endeavors into making sure that real history is taught. And I'm definitely in celebration of that. So um, she's going to say a few remarks at the beginning centering around the importance of teaching true history and some of the legislation that's being uh, wrestled with um, this, this trying to defeat that. Um, I'm gonna give her a few minutes to just say the things that she'd like to say and share something she posted in the chat that's linked for you guys to uh, follow up with her on. So um, Ms. Abbott, if you, if you're ready, take, take it away. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just want to say real quickly, thanks again for everybody who's joining us tonight. And if you are watching, we're streaming this on Facebook Live, and we do have one of our associates uh, interns looking at the Facebook page. So if you do have a comment or question, we will be looking at that too, and we'll bring it to the, the Zoom group. Just want to make sure the Facebook folks uh, know that they'll have a chance to be as interactive as possible. Absolutely. And one other thing before you go, Ms. Abbott. Um, for certain, again, even on Facebook, keep the comments, you know, about what we're discussing and it's fine to have some, some feedback in that space also, but any criticisms or thoughts that you want to share, let's take that offline. Um, let's just have a, a robust and, and uh, edifying conversation tonight after the uh, presentation. Now, with that being said, Ms. Abbott, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the space. Um, and I'm not going to take up much of the time. One. Uh, when I initially had asked to be part of the agenda, I was thinking it was just our racial equity learning committee committee meeting. So uh, I am um, just um, really great that you uh, allowed me this this time. Um, yes, I will share the link again. Uh, my comment is about House Bill 324. And um, what is regarding is that North Carolina with uh, at least 14 other states are putting in restrictions uh, or trying to put in restrictions on how content is being taught in the classroom. And I think that that is um, something that all of us should be aware of, not only teachers, but all of us in regards to um, the process that's being trying to uh, be made. So uh, the link is just to a three slide presentation. Um, it just gives information about the bill. Uh, then the second slide is um, four articles uh, regarding um, similar measures that are made. And one of them is one that I did with Chalk Beat. Um, that was posted this week in regards to um, the ability to teach history uh, and to teach those truths of history. And then the last slide on the presentation is about my passion project um, because the teaching of history isn't just at the footsteps, at the foot of teachers, it's for all of us to take control of that. And we have these different spaces and places to do that. And one of them is within the museum. So this uh, project that I'm doing, Griggs versus Duke Power is a undertow a part of history. It's a United States Supreme Court uh, case that dealt with uh, 13 African-American men doing the ending of the civil rights movement. So 1971. And um, like I said, a lot of people don't even realize um, that that happened right here in, in this county. So I'm trying to get that message out, but also to make sure that we understand it's not always teachers that need to be teaching the history, um, that all of us should, should play a part in that. All right. Thank you so much for um, what you're doing. and. Uh... As I stated, she, uh, Ms. Abbott's received a little attention on from some historians on Twitter for her efforts, and I applaud you. Um, 
I know there's a lot of conversation going on right now around this, uh, these ideas around, uh, what is it, race theory or uh, race theory. critical race theory. Critical race theory. I, for one, and it's a bigger discussion, so you know we'll have it if we want to. At some point, we can unpack it further. But I think we're we're taking a misstep in in certain ways by just not addressing it as history, history that has been uh, untaught, because you know the the critical race theory thoughts can take us places we don't need to go when we can just uh, look in the archives and uh, talk to people who experienced it firsthand. So history's going to be a part of any conversation. Why not make the conversation about history? Um, thank you all again for attending. And this is still an RELC meeting. So let's not uh, forget that. It is um, th where there's a moment and an opportunity to collaborate. We will do so. And it just so happens it made sense to do this on this particular night when we generally um, have other space for uh, GFB with uh, NC100. It's all connected. I actually, I'm, on, I'm in both places. And uh, I'm glad that my team was able to make it tonight. Uh, I see Lissette, and I know I saw Adam. Um, thank you guys for being here. And if at the end or you have something else you want to add before I forget something or whatever, I already said we'll have some announcements at the end. So um, guys, please keep me uh, in the right place with that. So um, I see a lot of people that I'm familiar with. I'm glad you made it, uh, Dr. Elliot. I see one of my aunts is tuned in. So yeah, this is this is great. Uh, some of the usual suspects, uh, Bob and Julia and Greg, thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to start tonight's uh, topic and conversation with uh, first telling you what it is in case you didn't read that beautiful flyer that uh, was was made by one of the young ladies that that works with uh, NC100. Um, the topic is the history of policing in America, uh, sanctioned discrimination and violence against America's most vulnerable citizens. And when I say most vulnerable citizens, I'm speaking of African-Americans, I'm speaking of black Americans, um, of people that have a significant experience here in this country, one that I feel needs to be recentered because uh, a lot has taken place due to the experiences of so many uh, black Americans, yet, uh, they, or we, or however you want to frame it as a group, have not seen some of the uh, overarching societal benefits. Um, and that's what we're still wrestling with today. You know, a lot of the conversations that have been had in the last uh, year uh, were spurred, excuse me, by uh, the unfortunate uh, death, uh, murder of George Floyd. And... Um, COVID happened and everybody had a chance to sit home and sit in it. And, you know, there was no avoiding it. Uh, and it caused a lot of people to just rethink some of the ways that they viewed society and some of the ways that they viewed uh, Black Americans in this society. So with all of that being said and understood, before we get to uh, Dr. Parker, there was a couple things I wanted to share that I thought what pertinent in framing the conversation we're about to have. Uh, Dr. Parker's gonna uh, go into his significant authority on uh, the history of policing in terms of uh, its, its origin story, uh, colonial, colonialism and, and things of that nature. Um, I'm going to begin by reading an excerpt or a, a, a article from a work that I happened to come across while I was working at UNC um, as a grad student, and we were, I was working at, for the digital, uh, the, the, the digital, North Carolina Digital Heritage Center. And um, I had this, this opportunity to scan just documents from all over North Carolina that people would submit to us. And one box I received was called uh, Wartime Reminiscences and other selections by J.M. Hollowell. This was in the box. It was this uh, little pamphlet that was published by the Goldsboro Herald in uh, June of 1939. So <clears throat> as a historian, or at the time getting my master's in history, I often would come across documents, especially in that job where I would 
look for, for, for the presence of Black Americans. Um, look for mentionings, look for things to, to resonate with me about uh, the people that I'm most interested in researching in history. And in this work, um, flipping through as I scanned, I found a, a insert of, in, in there that caught my attention. And I'm gonna read that. And uh, I hope you guys get where I'm going with what I'm saying in terms of context. So this, this excerpt I'm about to read was published in Wilmington in 1909. And this was a friend of Mr. Hollowell who was reminiscing about days that he wished had not gone by, so to speak. And it was concerning uh, how he missed how uh, Black Americans were treated at a particular time. So I'm gonna read it. It ha does have some language that may uh, great people, but we're all adults here, I hope. And if we're not, I think we are able to process it. So you do not hear on the streets of Goldsboro nowadays, the once familiar saying, quote, run nigga, run, or the patrol will catch you, unquote. But this expression was a common one in Goldsboro for about a generation. In ye olden days, it was the mayor's duty to appoint a number of citizens every day to patrol the town at night and see if all the colored people were at home. If one was found away from home without a pass, the patrol would give him a good whipping and let him go. I expect some of the colored people of Goldsboro could give some rich experiences along the line if they would. The man who was elected captain of the patrol furnished supper for the party. One night when I was captain while we were at supper in the house now occupied by Mr. Powell, we heard a loud outcry, which came from the old fairgrounds. Going there, we found on the fence in the rear of Mr. Pimpkin's house, a Negro man belonging to Mr. W.K. Lane. He was holding a rooster in his hands and a couch whip snake which had wrapped itself around the Negro's leg and the fence was holding him and whipping him. He had stolen the rooster from Mr. Pimpkin. While he was getting over the fence, the snake caught him. We killed the snake, but while the man had already had a whipping from his snake, it was our duty to whip him too. So we put in one in good shape and then let him go home. But the snake had already fixed him. Short for a while afterwards, um, for a short while afterwards, white swelling set in and the man's leg had to be amputated. Um, I share that because that's a published um, story that's reminiscent about the treatment of black people at a time when they were enslaved and it's published in 1909, and this overall pamphlet is published in 1939. So I'm speaking about that because it is a reinforcement over decades of certain behaviors and certain ideas that center around Black Americans. Um, I call that conditioning. I call that seasoning. That's what they called it when they parked the, the slave ships on the shores of America and let them sit for a while. So uh, enslaved Africans could get used to the climate. So I'll share one other thing before we get to Dr. Park, and this will be a little, little bit briefer, I think, and if I can see it in the, in the light. So this is also to just give an idea of how long America's been wrestling with the issue of how Black people are perceived here, which of course is going to lend itself to how they're policed. It's, it's got to be connected, right? Um, so I think it's 1944, uh, Gunnar Maidal uh, published this massive study on uh, the Negro problem, so to speak. It's called An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem and Modern Democracy. So this is 1944, and it's a massive study. It's a pretty thick book. But he, uh, he pays attention at that time to how Black Americans are policed, and he's primarily focusing on the South. And I'll just read a couple of uh, things out of here that I thought was significant and that 
help us frame the night also. Uh, the Negro's most important public contact is with the policeman. He is the personification of white authority in the Negro committee, community. There he is, the law, with badge and revolver, his word final. He is the state's witness in court and as defined by the police system and the white community, his word must be accepted. Another uh, excerpt. In many, but not all Southern communities, Negroes complain indignantly about police brutality. It is part of the policeman's philosophy that Negro criminals or suspects or any Negro who shows signs of insubordination should be punished bodily. And that this is a device for preventing crime for keeping the Negro in his place, generally. It is apparent, however, that the beating of arrested Negroes frequently in the wagon or on the way to jail or later when they are already safely locked up often serves as vengeance for the fears and perils the policemen are subjected to while pursuing their duties in the Negro community. When once the beating habit has developed in a police department, it is according to all experience difficult to stop. It appeals to primitive sadistic impulses ordinarily held down by education and other social controls. In this setting, the application of the third degree, quote, third degree, unquote, to get confessions from Negro suspects easily becomes a routine device. Police brutality is greatest in the regions where murders are most numerous and death sentences are more frequent, which speaks against its having preventive crime effects, preventing crime. Uh, the observer who visits several communities and can make comparison becomes convinced that on the contrary, police brutality has thoroughly demoralizing effects on the Negroes. So I say all of that to say, this is nothing new. This is something that's been going on for an enormous amount of time. And policing is not something I believe anybody is against. It is a necessary thing in our communities to keep them safe. However, we need to understand why certain behaviors are visited upon a group of people here. And that's what we're here to discuss. That's what we're here to talk about. Um, I am going to put in the chat a link to that entire uh, J.M. Hollowell uh, reminiscence. Uh, it's still posted at the uh, Digital Heritage Center and it has a blog that I wrote back then um, that tries to frame the whole work, but you can go through, flip through, you may find something I didn't. But uh, I'm posting that and I am going to get out of the way and let um, somebody I hold very near and dear and, and in very high regard. Um, he's, he's a former professor of mine. Um, I still think of him as a professor um, and I remain in contact with him because I value him. He's, he's an important person in, in my life and I appreciate him being available to do this with us tonight. And uh, I thank you, Dr. Parker, I'll let you take it away. Okay, good evening, everybody. And thank you, Felton, for this opportunity to be here with you this, this evening, uh, based on our conversations over the past couple of years. It appears that y'all have a real good time on Thursday evenings, uh, discussing uh, a lot of different topics. Uh, I'm here tonight to talk about policing in America. And, and from the very outset, with the establishment of slavery, uh, whites in colonial America who were familiar with slavery because slavery existed in the Americas since the early 1500s. So when Jamestown was established in 1607 and later uh, in North Carolina in 1663, whites sought to control the enslaved population. And I submit that when we look around us today and witness the killing of so many black men and women by the state, by the government, 
and by white citizens in general. It is all about control, control of a population whose lives never mattered because if they had really mattered, they would not have been brought to the Americas and the hulls of more than 50,000 voyages across the Atlantic Ocean over the span of more than 350 years. Black lives never matter. What I would like to do uh, this evening is to provide uh, historical perspective and an overview on policing in America and show that the killings of Dante Wright and Rashad Brooks, Daniel Prue, Tray Traylon Martin, Brianna Taylor, Aura Rosser, Stefan Clark, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, and countless other black men and women over the past, just past few years, is the continuation of an ongoing theme that can be traced back to the days of enslavement, through Reconstruction, and Jim Crow. Today is no different than the massacres of hundreds of Black people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, exactly 100 years ago at the end of this month, May 31st. Colfax, Louisiana in 1873, when 150 Black people were killed at the hands of a white mob. Wilmington in 1898, Atlanta 1906, Elaine, Arkansas in 1919, Rosewood 1923, the lynching of nearly 5,000 Black folks that we know about, that we know about between 1865 and 1960. And so the beat goes on. I will use North Carolina as an example of the violence heaped upon enslaved and free people to maintain control in order to maximize profits. In 1715 in North Carolina, slavery had been established in 1663. Legal slavery was established in 1663. By the time we get to 1700, there are approximately 1,000 enslaved people in North Carolina. In 1715, North Carolina established its first slave code. That slave code was steeped in Roman tradition. And, and the purpose of the code was to establish boundaries, to establish a relationship between blacks and whites, which indicated in every way that whites were superior and Blacks were inferior. Let me give you an example or examples of the slave code in North Carolina passed in 1715. Uh, the very first code stated that it was unlawful for slaves to be insolent or recalcitrant to whites. That is, you couldn't be stiff-necked. You couldn't talk back to if a 14-year-old black boy told a 40, 14-year-old white boy told a 40-year-old black man what to do, you gotta do it, no questions asked. Number two, all slaves must be in possession of a pass or ticket when they left the owner's premises. In North Carolina, it was, it was called the pass system. And so if, if Charles, the enslaved person uh, went to town to pick up supplies for his master. He had to be in possession of a piece of paper with his name on it. That pass indicated where Charles was going. It indicated the intentions, his intentions, and it also indicated the time that Charles must be back. And each pass contained the name of the owner or the person giving Charles permission to go into town. Some places across the South, it was called the ticket system. But 
no matter where, where you were, you had to be in possession of that pass. If you didn't have that pass and someone asked for it, you were considered, what do you think? A runaway slave. It was unlawful for a slave to run away from the owner's premises. Very important. I mean, you know, the institution is built on the enslaved person being on the premises to work from can't see in the morning until can't see at night. Following that law was a law which made it illegal to teach enslaved people to read and write. Now, why is it that you would not want a slave to have this ability to read and write? Well, I've heard people say, you don't want a slave to read the Bible. Maybe. You don't want that person to have the ability to read the newspaper. Maybe. But the chief reason you don't want your slave to have this ability to read or write is that they can write themselves a pass. And, and the advertisements for runaway slaves are replete uh, with those examples. I, I have the case of a, of a slave by the name of Charles who belonged to a UNC Chapel Hill professor. This professor had evidently taught Charles how to read and write. Not only that, he would allow Charles to go visit his family in Raleigh. That is, Charles lived on a plantation in Orange County, but he had a wife and children in Wake County. In 1827, the UNC professor allowed Charles to go visit his family. And usually he would leave on a Friday or Saturday and he had to be back at work by Monday morning. Well, on this Monday morning, Charles didn't return. Two months later, Charles had not returned. Six months later, Charles had not returned. A year, Charles had not returned. Two years later, no Charles. So the owner advertised in the Hillsborough Recorder that Charles left him in 1827, but had been seen in Norfolk, Virginia. He had been seen in Wilmington, North Carolina and, and other places. And each time someone asked him for a pass, he presented that pass with the owner's signature. So this ability to read and write, and I try to instill in, in students that knowledge is power. If someone is going to pass a law like North Carolina did in 1830, making it a capital offense if a slave were caught reading and writing, a capital offense. For the first offense, it was 39 lashes across the bare back. For the second offense, it was actually capital punishment. So that's, that's something about, about knowledge and having knowledge. Knowledge equals power. Uh, law was also passed by the North Carolina Code, which did not allow free Blacks to marry a white person. And many of you may know that that law was actually on the books, not only in North Carolina, but you remember in 1967, the United States Supreme Court struck down these laws. We're talking 1715 to 1967 in the US Supreme Court case, Loving versus Virginia. Slaves were prohibited from carrying guns or weapons, even for hunting, or both they and their owner faced punishment. Slaves were prohibited from raising livestock, raising their own garden, preaching in public, and selling liquor or hiring out their time. Enslaved people in North Carolina could not play games of chance. No cards, no dice, no nine pins. 
for any money, for any liquor, or any kind of property. That law was on the books in North Carolina until 1865. Slaves and free blacks could not testify in any of the courts against whites, only against other blacks. North Carolina established two court systems, one for the enslaved and one for, uh, for whites. And blacks could never enter uh, those white courts. And that remained in place even beyond slavery. We know that blacks could not testify against, uh, against whites. It was unlawful for slaves to conspire or even participate in insurrection or rebellion. The punishment was death or transport to another state in the case of a free black. Free blacks who participated in conspiracy or rebellion uh, shall be adjudged guilty of a felony and shall suffer death without benefit of clergy. And in many cases I've seen in the court records where those uh, free blacks who participated, I mean, we're not talking about an actual insurrection or rebellion, but a conspiracy, uh, that individual uh, in most cases was uh, actually sent out of the state of North Carolina. Uh, with regard to punishment, the legislature passed laws which allowed owners and law enforcement authorities to whip the enslaved, crop their ears, and kill them without judicial reprisal. North Carolina passed what is called an ear cropping law in 1741. And, and this was all a part of the, the Roman tradition, uh, even before the law was passed, when an enslaved person committed an offense on the plantation or the farm, uh, his owner might nail his ear to the barn and, and let him or her stand there for hours, uh, after which a portion of the ear would be severed or cropped. When the law was passed in 1741, it specified that uh, the individual slave who committed an offense would be taken to the pillory and uh, the, the ear would be nailed to the post and the individual would uh, have to stand there for 90 minutes after the ear had been severed and then the other ear would be uh, cropped. North Carolina also passed in 1759, a castration law designed exclusively for black men. So if the law were passed in 1759, we do know that the act had been going on for a number of years. And so legally in North Carolina, uh, sheriffs and deputy sheriffs usually were the ones who carried out this act. They could castrate an individual. Sometimes in the records you would see to have their steel balls removed uh, or simply uh, where castration was used or to cut off the privates. And even though the law did not specify this, in, in many cases, deputies and, and lawmen would actually force the enslaved person to eat uh, those parts. And uh, it, you, you can imagine with the state of medicine at that time, most of the individuals who were castrated uh, died. Some did survive, but most died. In 1741, it was a big year for the passage of legislation in North Carolina. As a matter of fact, the slave code was revealed, but was, uh, was actually uh, completely uh, redone, revised in 1741 because of an insurrection that took place down in South Carolina in 1739, known as the Stono Rebellion. And it was uh, after that Stono Rebellion that in 1740, South Carolina 
revised its code in 1741. North Carolina revised its code, slave code. And about 37% of the laws in that code uh, dealt specifically with uh, runaway slaves. Uh, runaway slaves uh, absolutely threatened the institution of slavery because what it did was to put complete separation between the enslaved and the enslaver. And, and we do know that there are cases when these runaway slaves were successful. That is, they were gone for 10 years, 15 years, 16 years. And so as a result of that, most of the legislation uh, that we see in the slave code dealt specifically with uh, those runaways, uh, runaway slaves. But in 1741, North Carolina passed what was called outlawry legislation. Uh, the, the law allowed citizens to kill runaway slaves and they would be compensated for doing so. Uh, the way the law was set up was this. If, was, if an individual ran away and the owner uh, was tired of this individual running away, he could actually go to two justices of the peace and draw up what they called a proclamation of outlawry. And those two justices would draw up a proclamation indicating that the slave had run away uh, one time or several times, and that upon catching this individual, you could bring him or her back to his or her owner. You could kill the slave. If you kill the slave, then of course, uh, the owner would be compensated 75% the, uh, the slave's value. So if the slave were worth $300, um, I'm sorry, two thirds the value. If the slave were worth $300, then the owner would be compensated $200. This was a special fund uh, that uh, the um, colony of North Carolina and Virginia and other places set up to deal with this problem of, uh, of runaway slaves. And believe it or not, in North Carolina, the legislation, outlawry legislation, was on the books until 1975. 1975, so in North Carolina, if an individual in 1960 had been outlawed, you could kill that person without any judicial reprisal. And depending on the owner, depending on what the circumstances were, you might even be uh, compensated for killing that individual. Slaves who were freed in North Carolina had 90 days to leave the state. So you ask the question, why is it that, for example, in 1830, you had 22,000, almost 23,000 uh, free Blacks. And in 1860 or 1865, when slavery ended, there were approximately 31,000 free Blacks. Uh, for the most part, North Carolina did not enforce this law. But it did state that if slaves who were freed in North Carolina, they, if a slave were freed in North Carolina, he or she had to leave the state within 90 days and they were never to return. The idea was that North Carolina was a slave state, not a free state. If you get your freedom, then you make it to Massachusetts. You make it to Ohio, you go to Canada, but anywhere except North Carolina. Now, for those individuals who uh, violated this law, uh, they could be returned to slavery. And we do have many examples where individuals were actually returned um, to slavery. Now, that's just a few of the laws that were passed uh, in North Carolina. But when we become the United States of America. The federal government actually gets involved with this slavery thing as well. And you can go to the United States Constitution today and look at three different sections 
articles and sections that deal specifically with the institution of slavery. Now, the framers of the Constitution were, were very smart not to use the word slave, not to use the word Negro, not to use any term that associated the nation with the support of the institution of slavery. And, and this, they said, was done for the sake of posterity. So that tonight, as we talk about this, you, know, you won't be able to say that the Constitution actually used that terminology and supported the institution of slavery. But had not the Constitution supported slavery, then there, there's a possibility that North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia and Virginia, they never would have joined the United States. They never would have ratified the, North, uh, ratified the US Constitution. As a matter of fact, North Carolina was a very 12th state to ratify the Constitution uh, because you know, they could not find certain uh, articles that dealt with the institution of slavery and in personal liberties. And they toyed back and forth, uh, our five delegates did for, for months before they, uh, they agreed that, that North Carolina would be a part of the United States. But in the very, very first article of the United States Constitution, Article I, Section 2, we're talking about the framers of the Constitution getting together in May of 1787. And within a few days of their deliberations, they were confronted with the problem, the issue of slavery. Article One, Section Two deals with what we call the Three-Fifths Amendment. You know, it was decided that there would be two chambers, Upper House, Lower House, Senate, House of Representatives. It was determined that in the Senate, you'd have two representatives. In the House of Representatives, it would be based on population. Southerners said, okay, if it's based on population, we should also count our slave population. Northerners said, no, you have always said that they are property, so slaves should not be counted. Well, as it turned out, they reached a compromise, the three-fifths compromise, the three-fifths amendment. And in essence, it said that rather than counting the, all of North Carolina's 100,000 slaves in 1800, we will count just 60,000 of them. And the same thing for all of the, uh, the other Southern states. That was not the case, of course, uh, in the Northern and Western states. <clears throat> Article one, section nine uh, deals with the extension of the slave trade. Southerners obviously wanted the slave trade to continue. By the time we get to 1787, you know, hundreds of thousands of Africans had come into uh, colonial America and they wanted uh, it to continue. On the other hand, Northerners did not want to see it continue. So they reached a compromise. And in that compromise, uh, you can find in Article 1, Section 9, uh, they agreed that they would extend the slave trade until January 1st, 1808. So when January 1st, 1808 rolled around, it became unlawful for Africans to come into the United States via the Atlantic slave trade. And we know that, uh, that even though that, that, that constitutionally it was unlawful, uh, probably between 50 and 60,000 Africans came into the U.S. between 1808 and 1865. The next article that deal that, that, that the framers had to deal with was introduced by Pierce Butler of South Carolina. Butler made it clear that South Carolina would never join the United States of America if they did not protect the institution of slavery. Specifically, he meant for those, those slaves who ran away from South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, into New York and into Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Because once they got there, if they didn't have protection, it meant that they were free. So Pierce Butler and his comrades in the South said, 
we, we're not going to be a part of this, this nation if you don't do something about our runaway slave population. And so in Article 4, Section 2, you have the Fugitive Slave Clause. And that clause, in effect, says that any slave running from a slave state into a free state, into a free state, absolutely is not free. That once they make it there, they are still slaves. Unless they make it beyond the borders of the United States, I don't care where they go, they are still slaves. And, 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 and sadder than that, for female slaves who fled, any children born in New York, I don't care if you had five, 10 or 15, all of those individuals, all those children still belong to the master back down in North Carolina. The child inherited the status of the mother. So unless you were free somehow, and as long as according to the constitution, if you were not freed by your owner, then you, you're still a slave. And so courts were established in, in the North to deal specifically with individuals who ran into the North. Uh, fortunately for runaway slaves, um, many of the Northern states did not enforce uh, the, this section of the constitution, nor did they enforce uh, the law that was passed in 1793, known as the Fugitive Slave Law. And, and what that law said was that if a slave ran from North Carolina to Pennsylvania and someone harbored or gave refuge to that slave and was found out, uh, and that, that individual went to court, then he or she had to pay $500 and or be imprisoned for one year. Now, $500 is a lot of money today, but imagine now you multiply that about 40 times today, but $500. And because the law was not rigidly enforced, uh, Southern legislators in, in Washington continued to try to strengthen that law and they were able to get it strengthened in 1850 as a part of the compromise of 1850 when it was uh, established that an individual had to pay at least a thousand dollars and or be in prison for a year. Not only that, each judge sitting there over that trial would be given ten dollars for every case of an individual who was found guilty. So a judge is encouraged to find people guilty. And the sad part about that second fugitive slave law is that. It, it, was, it was rigidly enforced. Sadly, hundreds of individuals who were never enslaved were rounded up on the streets in Rochester, New York, and New York City, and Philadelphia, and other places, and brought back down to the South as slaves. If you've seen the story, uh, 12 Years a Slave, that's a classic example of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 uh, working Southerners. One of the things that I mentioned was control. And in 1753, even though the colony was a little late doing this, North Carolina established what they call the patrol system, like their northern neighbor and southern neighbor, Virginia and South Carolina. They now have a patrol system that is dedicated exclusively to dealing with the slave population. The North Carolina, like the other colonies, always had a militia, but that, that militia was, was multitasked. They dealt with the problems of the colony. They dealt with the Native American issue. They dealt with problems in general. Uh, and also they dealt with uh, the, slave, uh, the slave issue. But now you have a patrol system that is dedicated exclusively to dealing with with uh, the slave issue. And believe me, the patrol system in North Carolina and Virginia uh, was one that was feared by Black folks. Um, you know, the way it was set up in North Carolina, it was county-based. A county would be divided in what, into what they call patrol districts. 
So you take uh, Guilford County, for example, they may have had five districts and you'd have three or five or eight uh, individuals, uh, white patrollers in each uh, of those uh, uh, districts. So if you had five, if you had you know five uh, in each district, you're talking about 25 individuals patrolling that county between sundown and sunup. And patrollers were given the authority to go on to plantations, go into cabins to make sure that enslaved people were doing what they were supposed to be doing. They had powers to dash out whippings, no more than 10 lashes. Uh, they had ultimate authority to do uh, what they wanted to to the slave population. Uh, if, if this is a, if you ever get a chance to, to try to read about the patrol system uh, throughout the South, it, it is it's a good read because the, there are many, so many different layers involved. Uh, even fears enslaved people, fear the, the, the patrol system, uh, they oftentimes would kill patrollers, they would burn down their homes, they would destroy their property. Uh, patrollers themselves, while they were patrolling, he had to be 21 years of age and older, while they were patrolling, they did not, did not have to serve on the jury, uh, on jury, they were given passes to go this place, that place. So there were a few perks, but in many cases, because uh, white patrollers feared what, feared that there may be retaliation by enslaved people, they would uh, do like folks did to avoid the war. They go missing in action and they would actually go from county to county or from colony to colony to avoid serving as a patrol. Okay, I'm just about to bring this to in uh, Felton, but let me do a few more uh, examples. Um, um, it was always legal in North Carolina to kill an enslaved person. It, it was legal. You could kill an enslaved person and the burden of proof was always on the dead slave. The, dead, the, the burden of proof was on the dead slave because an owner just wouldn't kill his or her slave. So in 1791, North Carolina passed a law which made it a capital offense to kill a slave maliciously. Now the operative term in this law is maliciously. How do the state prove that the individual was killed maliciously? And I can tell you that between 1791 and, and at least 1829, uh, no white person was executed. By the way, this was a capital offense. No white person was killed or was uh, actually sentenced to death and uh, executed for killing a slave. Not one. Uh, there was a case down in uh, um, Jones County where a man suspended his female slave from an apple tree and it's believed that he administered between 200 and 300, 250 and 300 lashes over her body. Uh, the woman died. Uh, a neighbor reported the incident. The man was arrested, uh, but acquitted because it could not be shown that he killed her maliciously. These laws remained in effect, all of these laws until the end of slavery, after which black codes were passed, beginning in 1865. You have to understand that people who had enslaved people for generations did not want the institution to come to an end. And North Carolina is, is a classic example of that. And the reason North Carolina has not moved forward yet, the reason it has been considered one of the most backward states in the South, the reason it was called the Rip Van Winkle state, the reason it, 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 it gave this governor be the last state in the union to give this governor veto power, 
you know, the reason it, it is looked at as, as a backward state is because it refused to deconstruct in 1865. It could not reconstruct because it could never deconstruct. It couldn't release itself from yesterday. And to a great extent, you know, we're holding on to yesterday. And you know, within, uh, I'm 15 minutes from, from uh, Graham and, and, and you know, we've been fighting for a very long time. Right behind me, you know, this, that sesquicentennial park that's in Graham. And we've been struggling to get this renamed Wyatt Outlaw Park. Uh, the, uh, the city just uh, three months ago uh, said no. Uh, the council said no. But of course, that struggle continues. You know, so we're still holding on to the past with, our, with their memorials and their monuments. And, and even though we say it's, it's all about heritage for people, when I go around that square in Graham, I look up and I see this memorial, a memorial to hate, a memorial to maintain a way of life, a, a memorial that edified the institution of slavery. It, it says that it's okay that black women were raped. It says that it's okay that black men were killed. And you know, I see that on a daily basis. Anyone else who goes around that, that monument. And so folks wanna know why would, why do you want to, to bring it down? Well, if you know anything about the history of this nation, uh, it rolls off your tongue very easily. But black codes were passed to replace the slave codes. And, and when you look at these slave codes, you might think that they were passed just a few days ago, a few weeks ago, a few years ago, because what we see yesterday, we definitely see today. North Carolina passed nine laws and they included the nine blacks the right to vote. And when I look around today at all of these states that are trying to turn back the hands of time. I mean, it's already been, already been shown that, that, that voter fraud was, was, was next to zero. But so many of these states are trying to come up with a solution where there is no problem. And so in 1865, North Carolina passed a law denying Blacks the right to vote, denied them the right to serve on juries where a white defendant uh, was being tried. A, a black could not testify against a white. Uh, the black code also established capital punishment for any black man accused of raping a white woman. Capital. If a white man raped a white woman, uh, the penalty was two years. It denied blacks to the right to own or carry a gun unless they obtained a license a year before the purchase of the firearm. And the code prohibited interracial marriages. Uh, another part of, uh, of this whole policing and efforts to maintain the status quo occurred as soon as slavery ended with the convict lease system. I don't know how many have heard of this convict lease system, but it was an attempt to uh, place those individuals back into slavery using, actually using the 13th Amendment to do so. And so as it, as it turns out, uh, it saved the state a lot of money because what you would do if an individual is, had committed, I'm talking about the least offense you would send that individual to prison for 20 years, for five years, 10 years, but that individual was hired out to a company and the company had to pay the state. So the state doesn't have a housing issue, doesn't have a meal feeding issue. You know, it, it relieved the state. And, and during the course of you know, 40 years or so, 200,000 people across the South 
were caught up in this convict lease system. Not only men, but women as well. Uh, suits were filed because of the rape of, of Black women. Uh, we're talking about uh, thousands actually killed, in many cases being worked to death uh, as a part of this convict lease system. And when you look at the establishment of Black organizations in the 1880s and 1890s, one of their demands was that there be uh, something done about police brutality. In, in 1941, in Durham, there was this 1942, a huge conference. And out of that conference, where you had about 55 Blacks from across the country coming to North Carolina Central University, they came up with what they call the Durham Manifesto in December of 1942. And, and one of the chief demands was that there be the stoppage to police brutality in the Black community. And, and that not only that, but Black police officers be hired. I mean, we can go across the South, go across the country, really, and pinpoint when the first Black policeman was hired in this town, in that town. And in many cases, we're talking about the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, I was talking to uh, a friend who is on her way back from Rochester, New York, where her father actually became the first black policeman in Rochester, in a small area outside of Rochester, New York. And he, he, he was 90 years old when he passed just a few days ago. But he talked about the fact that during his 38 years of policing, he pulled his gun five times, never shot one single person. He pulled it five times in 38 years. And, and we see trigger happy policemen who are on the force for one year. You know, they, they have a kill under the belt already. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure exactly what's going on with the training of people, hot headedness. And, and of course, we can never, never understate the fact that, that people see color. We see color. We, we take that color concept uh, all the way back to the institution of slavery. Uh, it's very difficult for seemingly for people to get past that. Uh, if you don't believe it, uh, just look at how mulatto, so-called mulattoes or, or mixed people of mixed ancestry have been able to make it when their darker brothers and sisters could not make it. I mean, how many enslaved people passed for white? How many ran away and found freedom because they could use their color? Color was important in in slave America, and is and is still important uh, right down to the present time. And I'll stop right there and entertain any questions. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Parker, for your time and for those uh that, that wonderful presentation. Unfortunately, we're relegated to this space and the applause and the things that usually come um, can't as they normally would. But I am certain that everyone here appreciates. Uh, you for what you're here doing at this very moment. Um, I want to make sure uh, we get to the point of questions and I wanted to just add before we do, we are aware that most people get their education, their ideas centering around America and race um, through media. And if you, if you disagree, I, I definitely would love to have a debate with you about it. Um, with that being said and understood, I am someone who focuses on that power um, media holds in shaping and framing how we depict our environment and our society. Uh, I take significant issue with some of the depictions that have come of late uh, that 
fantasize and, and fantasticalize the Black American experience. Uh, some TV shows, some movies of late have just done away with simple storytelling that frames this experience. Dr. Par Dr. Parker mentioned Charlie, uh, who ran away from a UNC professor he was enslaved by. Just tell his story. Uh, there's, there's many of them. And that can be effective in reframing, recalibrating, and reshaping how some people perceive this, this society we live in. Because media is that powerful. But when you throw in fantasy and magic and witches and monsters, you totally uh, dismiss the ability to really gain traction with people who are watching people. Um, I'll get off my soapbox right then and there. Uh, we are open to questions, reactions, thoughts, things you want to share. As I mentioned earlier, um, please reserve any aesthetic feedback for an email later or be on the lookout for a survey from us. Uh, I want to make sure before I forget, because I have that, that problem, I thank you again, Dr. Parker. I'm glad you're able to stick with us for some uh, questions and feedback. I want to make sure I elevate uh, the RELT, the team, uh, Lissette, Rodriguez, and I don't, let me see, people are here. To, yeah, Adam, Adam's here, Adam Schell is here, and I don't see Mona Lisa McCorkle, but she is our other uh, team member. So I want to make sure I highlight those folks, and if there's anything you want to say, just, you know, reserve it for the end. Let's set. I think you were going to share a couple of things at the end, so we'll get to it, but um, I'm going to make sure I highlight us before we get into things. Thank you all for being here. Anybody have any questions or thoughts and things they want to share? Um, I'm looking at the screen, but raise your hand or just start talking. Unmute yourself and start talking. Dr. Parker, uh, I miss you. I am so happy. Uh, Janae, it's so good <laughs> to see so you. I want to say, oh my gosh, I miss you so much. Um, and thank you for your, your beautiful spiel. As usual, um, I was very blessed to be able to take a few classes with you. Um, I do have a question, though. I wanted to know um, how connected is... The, the slave patrol system in North Carolina to the red shirt campaigns? You know, um, there are those of us who, who believe essentially that um, when slavery ended and because people wanted to hold on to the institution of slavery, um, many of those patrollers, without a doubt, we do know this, many of those patrollers became members of the Ku Klux Klan. They became members of the Knights of White Camellia. Uh, they also became members of the Wife Association of South Carolina and Louisiana. Uh, but more than those organized uh, groups were these individual acts of killing of both black and white people by people who were just pissed, just upset with the fact that we no longer have this institution. And uh, the Freedmen's Bureau began keeping records of atrocities, of what they called outrages by whites on blacks. That was the name of the publication. And they actually looked at, uh, for about 12 years, the atrocities uh, that we probably don't even, you know, we don't, we don't think about unless it was, you know, done by the KKK. You know, the hearings in 1871 indicated that, that the KKK had, had killed about 5,000 people, black and white, between 1866 and 1871. But what is not counted are the individual acts of terrorism that occurred in Moore County, North Carolina, where three men went into a house for no reason at all and killed the father, the mother, and all five children. And according to the Freedmen's Bureau, 
a little baby that was 10 months, of, 10 months old was stomped to death uh, with, with one of those individuals, by the heel of one of those individuals. You know, that, that, that's something that, that's not counted unless you go back and look at the individual Freedmen Bureau records in, in Louisiana and in Texas and North Carolina, Virginia, and so forth. So, you know, those individuals who played out during slavery are the same individuals who are playing out with the red shirts, with the KKK, and all of these atrocity organizations in addition to these individual acts of terrorism. Um, just so, uh, again, uh, uh, in framing things, and I definitely will be a little on the lookout for any other questions or comments, but um, time-wise, we sometimes act as if these things took place so long ago. We're so much better now than we have been or will be or could ever be. That was so long ago. Um, the piece that I began with uh, that was in the reminiscences of uh, Hollowell, uh, that was written and published in 1909, the section that I read to you all. My great grandmother, who I had the pleasure of knowing, was born in 1909. My great grandfather, who I had the pleasure of knowing, was born between 1880 and 1890. Um, that's less than a generation from slavery that is right in the middle and before some of the things we're discussing in terms of the Wilmington race massacre, the Tulsa race massacre. Um, so these things are not that long ago. I have met people, I've known people. My grandmother who I recently lost, uh, my father's mother was born in 1930. Uh, th this stuff is, is, is not that ancient history that we don't have to wrestle with. As Dr. Parker has stated, we have not wrestled with it. And that is a big part of the problem. Um, um, let me get the screen back if I can to where I can see everyone for a moment. Um, do we have any more uh, comments, uh, Lisette? I have a question. So Dr. Parker, I would love for you um, and your brilliant mind to help me think through how does the historical context of policing show itself today in our policing? Um, and I kind of know, but I would love to hear from your perspective and your knowledge. Uh, Lissette, I think that, that everything uh, I have said from the outset uh, indicates this nexus between yesterday and today. It, the tragedy is that the mindset with uh, a man with his knee on a black man's neck, that mindset is no different than the mindset of a Ku Klux Klaner in 1865. It's no different than those individuals who bombed Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. It's no different than the killing of scores of people in Rosewood, Florida in 1923. It's no different than what happened on Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, you know, in 1965. And, and so, you know, I, I said that it's an ongoing theme. Uh, people have long memory. People have long memory. When I say long memory, I'm talking about a condition that existed in 1755, 1715 that allowed for the creation of a slave code are the same conditions today in terms of that mindset that allow for the passage of the kind of legislation that's being passed in North Carolina, being passed in Georgia, being passed, you know, all over the country. The mindset is basically the same. And, and I think you know, an important term, important word is control. How do we control? How do we maintain the status quo? How do we conserve, you know, a way of a bygone way of life. How do we, as, as white folks, how do we ensure that today will somehow not be very different in terms of who is going to be running stuff? In 2050, 
we might be, you know, they're saying uh, we might be extinct if we don't do X, Y, and Z. And so what I'm saying, Lissette, is that the mindset in 1715, the mindset in 1607 with the extermination of the Native, Native American population, you know, with, with, with efforts to maintain, you know, a Western style way of life uh, has dominated thinking for hundreds of years. And honestly, I don't see it ending anytime. So I'm optimistic. I think that in three to four to 500 years, we might see some changes. But you know, the kind of change that I had hoped for in 1969 when you know, I was arrested for protesting I mean, I never thought that we'd be here in 2021 fighting for some of the same stuff. I hope that helped. It sure did. I just wanted to make sure that we shared that again. So thank you, <laughs> Dr. Parker. Sure. Well said. Thanks. Thanks for that, Dr. Parker. Um, Brother Mike has a has a comment he wants to make. I see your hand up. Yeah, you know, I apologize. My screen is off. I'm traveling. But yeah, I just want to speak on, you know, we talk about slavery and um, institutionalized things, you know, and the laws and bills that was passed. But even though laws and bills was passed, that didn't mean that people passed it in their mind on how they think and how they live and how they react to us. Uh, for so many years, Black lives have never mattered. Uh, when has there have when has there not white lives never matter, you know? So when we talk about these things about, you know, where this bill was passed for this and this was happened for this, but that did not never change how the white man thought about the black man, you know? So we can pass all these bills, but if a man or a woman don't change how they think or how they feel about a person, the, our surroundings will never change. So we talking bills and we talking laws you know, we talk about the, the um, police and stuff, you know, like you said, Park, Dr. Parker said, you know, a knee on our neck, you know, they have a knee on our children's neck. You know, I was thinking as we was talking, it's not a struggle to feed us in prison, but it's a struggle to feed our kids in school. That doesn't make sense. It's not a struggle to feed our kids and feed us in prison, but it's a struggle to feed kids in, in school. You know, when we start looking at these things, you know, the police, they shoot at a, a, a white piece of paper with a black silhouette. What are they trained to do? Shoot at a black person. The target is black. You know, um, a lot of these guys, you know, they was raised like that. You know, a lot of our black people are raised, you know. We feel as long as we get a, a seat in the room, as long as we get a position on the police force, we are all right. But it's bigger than that. You know, you got to be a, I'm a person, I know Brother Felton is, I know how Brother Merrill is. I'm a rub with some feathers, what I say, I, you know, it is cool with me, you know, I'm gonna look at my friend list and I'm gonna have less friends, I'm cool with that. Um, I'm gonna see you in public, you might turn your head, that's cool with me because I'm, I'm, with, I'm at the point where in life that enough is enough. You know, we talking about police reform, you know, as our Dr. Parker was talking about the Confederate soldier, I've stood with Graham so many times against that Confederate soldier. That Confederate soldier doesn't bring nothing but hate and, and, and angry people out. You know, it brings the angry people that, that fought in that war because all they do is support a flag that, that they didn't even win the war. And then it brings us out and we angry because we know what that flag represents, anger and hate and some bunch of rednecks. So I just say, you know, if laws and bills can pass, but if a man or woman's mind doesn't change, and that's black or white, Hispanic, whatever color, things are, things are always the same. So until people change, until people change in rooms that we're in, and we're having these uncomfortable conversations, things will never change. But as a someone I, I can't recall said, you cannot legislate morality. And Mike, me and you have had that conversation a couple of times, and that's absolutely the truth. But what we what we're trying to do, and I know what you are trying to do and what we are all in this space to do is to better inform ourselves, uh, maybe uh, recalibrate that piece of the mind that has us thinking one way when it is probably obvious to think another. Um, something I wanted to make sure I mentioned before um, we depart is, is 
something that I think a lot of people don't uh, necessarily process correctly when talking about history. And Dr. Parker, if you could explain that three fifths of a person thought that people often have when it is actually about something else. Yeah, I, I um, what has happened uh, is that uh, I hear people all the time say that, you know, they, they treated us like we were three fifths of a man, uh, three fifths of a woman. But, you know, when you look back at the Constitution itself, it had nothing to do with that. Uh, as I indicated earlier, it was about representation in the House of Representatives, counting three fifths of the individuals. Now, by the time we get to the 1830s and the abolitionist movement got underway, abolitionists are using everything in their arsenal to show up America, to show how America has, has actually uh, failed its, its, uh, its so-called Negro citizenry as they, the term terminology used back in the 1830s. And so, when we hear this notion that black people are three-fifths human beings, uh, just know that it, it comes out of the constitution, but black people are not three-fifths human beings. <laughs> I want that to be known. Three, they, they counted three-fifths of the population. Uh, so the abolitionist movement actually took that concept and they wanted America to see what you've done to your black citizenry. You have made them three fifths human beings. Greatly appreciated. I often have had conversations once I became better informed as to how that was intended um, to make sure that it's understood that we were basically still not considered human at all. Not three fifths of a person, but just property. Property, um, exactly. That's it. And, and counted as three fifths so that they could better represent themselves in a corrupt government. That's corruption. If it's, if it's not, then explain it to me because now we're trying not to be counted, not to count some people at all. So it's a, it's a yeah. fascinating place we, we dwell here in these, uh, <laughs> these United States. I mean, the bottom line is so much of yesterday still lives today. Absolutely. Uh, the nexus is there and you know, when uh, Malcolm X said many years ago, you uh, do us a grave justice when you allow us to read your history books. You know, uh, history is that subject, he said, which best rewards is research. So you need to learn about yesterday. I, I was talking to um, uh, someone the other day who Absolutely, no, it's, an, it's a college student, but he would say, I don't know anything. But he said, you know what? I started reading, I started reading history. And then he, he began to rattle off some information. And it, and it so happens that we were saying the same thing at the same time. So it, it told me, not that I'm right, but it told me that at least he's reading that and, and the sweet part about the whole thing was he was so proud of himself that he had taken time just to read a little history. Absolutely. Um, I had the pleasure of TAN this past semester for Dr. Elliot, and I think he's still here. I need to get the picture back, right? But um, yeah, we had a discussion that centered on uh, some of the students who, you know, if they had a light bulb moment of how important this stuff really is. And it's not for you to go off and become a some some dynamic, outstanding lecturer or teacher. It's for you to be better informed about the place you live. Um, it's for you to better understand why something is a certain way and why we're still fighting some of the same things that symbolically we've won. Uh, it's a, it's a it's an interesting uh, exploration if you take the time to, to look into it. Um, anybody have any other final thoughts or things I am going to say for purposes of RELC again and uh, for uh, NC100, thank you again, Dr. Parker. Um, I wanna make sure that we also uh, mention um, 
and let's say I'm going to say this and then you can definitely, you know, uh, mention whatever else you want to say about RELC and Adam, you too. Um, we're going to do this again. Uh, the plan is to uh, do this again in a, at our bi-monthly meeting, have another um, discussion centering on the topics that we uh, should be talking about, should be um, educating ourselves better about uh, the plan and goal for that one. And it's, it's early, but we're going to have a, a conversation centering on what white allyship looks like historically. Um, so you'll hear some of those uh, abolitionists that uh, Dr. Parker mentioned tonight. You'll hear uh, more about some people uh, and where they may have gotten that, that mentality to be more concerned with, with other groups besides uh, white people in America. So um, again, thank you all for attending. Um, Lisette, I'm gonna pass the mic to you so you can say a couple of things in case I forgot something. Or, and Adam, you too, like I said, this is, this is all a team effort. Thank you all for, for coming and showing up tonight. All right, y'all. So thank you so much, Dr. Parker. I feel like I want to upload all of the things that you shared and all of your knowledge. And I wish I could do that. Um, would love to hear more. Um, I felt like you finished and I was ready to get more information from you. Um, and so just a few announcements for our, our RELC uh, community. We do have some great things happening. We're going to continue to alternate times because we have some educators that um, are deserving of being present in our space. So we want to make sure that we allocate time and space for our educators. And we also have folks who are available typically during lunch hour. So we'll be alternating meetings just to, you know, assist with having more folks participate and engage in these fruitful conversations. Um, we were awarded a grant through the Reedsville Area Foundation to partner with the NC100 crew um, to hire a part-time position to really facilitate the behind-the-scenes work that the Reedsville, um, that our Rockingham Equity Learning Community is doing. So we all wear many hats in the leadership team and our community is so deserving of all of the things. So we need a permanent person that will help us uh, keep everything in place and help us with the organizational piece. Um, as far as updates are concerned, look out for our next meeting. We're meeting on a bi-monthly basis. So look out for that information um, as we transition forward. We're looking for topics that are uh, relevant to our current times and certain things that we're facing. Uh, so thank you so much for your participation today in this amazing dialogue. Dr. Parker, I can't thank you enough for the information that you shared this evening. Um, and Adam, if there's anything or Felton that I might have missed, please jump in and share. Uh, we're happy to share our email address. So for those of you who are not part of our racial equity learning community, please join us. Please share your knowledge and your wisdom and your thoughts. Um, this is a learning community, so we learn from each other. We grapple with really difficult dif discussions and conversations, and, and that's how movement happens. So um, thank you all. Well said, well said. Um, Adam, I can't see you, but if you want to say a couple words, I want to uh, get to Mr. J. Dwayne Garnett's question that I happen to miss and it's the only one there. And I think it'll be a good one to end on. I think it really will be in uh, uh, Dr. Parker and I could definitely comment on this question. Um, so Adam, are Thank you still? You. Okay, Felton, yeah. Hey, Felton, mm -hmm. can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Okay, great. Just wanna say thank you. Uh, sorry, I've had a uh, busy night tonight. I know everyone's busy, but uh, really enjoyed hearing Dr. Parker and uh, hearing from all of you all. It's just a great opportunity to learn more. Uh, exactly the kind of experience that the RELC is here for. So uh, just thank you all for your time, uh, and Dr. Parker specifically, um, and your words. It's a lot to think about, and uh, always enriching to learn about that. So just want to say thank you. I, I can't add much to what was that laid out. We're very excited about what's to come for the RELC, and I uh, hope that anyone uh, who would like to attend any of our events or meetings, certainly do so and reach out to us. We're happy to kind of have some fellowship and learning together. So 
those. Thank you all. Absolutely. Um, I'll say uh, also we are looking forward to getting back to meeting in person. Um, hopefully we can make that happen sooner than later uh, as COVID uh, leaves us, hopefully to never rear its ugly face, head, body again. And hopefully we won't have to deal with it um, much longer in the way that we have. We'll still be safe. Uh, outside is preferable. Hopefully it's not too hot. We got some shade, things of that nature. Um, again, thank you all. Uh, and I'm going to get to this last question. I keep fumbling with these views because I don't know if you guys see my computer the way I see it or what, but here we go. Um, J. Dwayne Garnett asks, and I think this is a good question to leave out on. So Dr. Parker, please. Uh, what are your thoughts on preserving undocumented history of our people and ways to encourage older Blacks to communicate? It's a great question. Um, you know, I, I often say that uh, so much of our history is in the graveyard. So much of it is out there in the graveyard. Um, one of the things I encourage young people to do, grandchildren, children, is to go out and, and interview your loved ones. Interview mama, interview daddy, interview cousins, uh, interview your, your grandparents. Um, I think people believe that uh, history somewhere is out there, but it's here. All history is local. Your history, a history of your family is just as important as the history of the Obama family. Putting your history together is just as important as anybody else's history. And, and I guarantee you, once you plunge into it and, be, and begin looking at the various layers of it and, and trying to take it back as, you, as far as you possibly can, oh my God, I mean, you're gonna be faced with every emotion that human beings can express when you do these family histories. So I, I think it's important that, that this connection be made between young people and older people and preserving uh, yesterday. You know, uh, my great grandfather was born a slave in Northern Orange County. And, and I feel like I know him, he just three generations away. You know, my father knew my great grandfather who was born a slave in 1851. And then the stories that have come down from my father, Bill Parker and Joanna McBroom who were married in 1870, you know, having seven children and those children meeting for 60 years, every year, you know, for family reunions, you just get these connections are made. So I would say that we need to, to definitely hone in and pull older people in by interviewing them and helping them to understand that, uh, you know, I'm 75 years old, I don't have an education, I don't know why you need to interview me. I mean, you have a story that, that, that I need to know that's just as valid as someone who has a PhD or MD or no degree at all. Uh, well stated. Uh, my grandmother, I'll say this for you, uh, Mr. Garnett, my grandmother, who I just mentioned in the past recently, wonderful conversations um, about her, her time in Carthage, um, her time in Greensboro. Um, it is very important. We need to celebrate that history. We need to engage and wrestle with it. And I'll challenge you to, to challenge that person in your family who thinks of themselves as the historian. There's some, there's always one person that just knows everything, sit down, talk to them, then figure out a way to go challenge them on it and see where you, what happens. It's, it's just, it can be a wonderful experience if you let it. Ajane, you want to take us home? I did want to add something. Number one, um, I think this is a, a beautiful question. Um, one thing I always remind myself um, is that when we're talking to our elders, sometimes 
a way that you have to encourage them to communicate is to listen to what they're already saying and not just try to hear what you want them to say. Um, and quite frankly, if you let them know that they are heard, um, that starts to tear down some of those insecurities about the fact that why would I say anything? I've never been heard. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of our, a lot of um, elders, Black elders feel that way. And so over time, they've hardened themselves to sharing because why? One, you might not be here. And so now I've poured all of this out. And if something bad happens to you, then I'm scared. You know what I'm saying? And I'm feeling like a piece of what I just gave is now gone. I can't get it back. Or I've been saying this and that. I've been crying. We, we went out in the streets and fought and nobody's heard me. So why do I keep talking? So first thing you have to do is to tell them that I hear what what you are saying. And because I hear what you are saying, I want to hear more of what you will say when you're ready. I'm here to listen. Um, and I and I want that. And finally, um, I'll just say that our undocumented history is documented inside of us. We just have to get it out. Um, and, and getting that out looks like just loving that person really hard for what they've been through. And, and where they're going and the way that they try to process that. Um, and sometimes that means forgiving them for the shenanigans that might come out of your mouth. Um, my great grandfather was, um, he was so beautiful in so many ways, but my, the fellowship with my elders in my family actually led me to um, my niche in history. I learned that my great grandfather and his father, they were small businessmen, but they put all of their money together. And what they did was they built a community. And me sitting down, listening to what they were saying, I was able to tease out and, and analyze what that actually meant for where my family lives. And today I have a whole passion because of that. Um, I, I am so passionate about studying Black community building, and that's what I'm becoming a historian of. And it's because I was patient, and, and I sat, and I, I heard what they were saying first. Absolutely. Well stated. Um, two quick things just to, to really solidify those points in my mind anyway, and I, I don't think I could do it much better. One, uh, Ajane and I have personal experience speaking to elders in a Black community. We did a project in Princeville. Uh, a couple years ago, and I think she ended up writing her thesis on. I think Ajane wrote her thesis on that Princeville uh, community. Uh, yes, Black folks have often been hesitant to share and open up. Um, sometimes it's because it's detrimental to their safety and that conditioning, just like any other conditioning lasts and it has residue. Um, secondly, as Ajane stated, some of this history that we want to see more of, it's, it's inside of us, it's inside of our elders, it's, it's, it's in our DNA, but it's also in some of those documents. Read between the lines, uh, that, that Hollowell document that I shared with you guys earlier, there's another passage where he talks about a Black man who was one of those free Blacks, and he just was, uh, he, didn't want to, he didn't want suffrage, he didn't want to, he didn't ever want to vote. So there's another passage in there that talks about somebody else from their perspective, but humanize that moment. Think about it differently. If this man was living and surviving as a free man, why would he do something that disrupted or, or jeopardized his freedom? So read between the lines when you're engaging with some of this stuff also. Um, I hope tonight has been edifying and uh, has, has provided everyone with some, some new or some some confirmation of knowledge they may have already possessed. We have enjoyed hosting. Um, look for us again next Thursday uh, for our normal uh, grown folks business where we, we do something similar. We just have good discussions, I think anyway, <laughs> good discussions around topics, current, old. Um, I am someone that pays a lot of attention to media. So some of it resides there, but we do trending stuff. Uh, but we, we gonna, we gonna definitely keep having these conversations that, that are centered around America's uh, race problem, because we're gonna we're gonna fix it in my lifetime, haha. Ha. So all right, thank you all um, for being here. Is there anything I missed? I know uh, Meryl gave a shout out to the interns that are doing work uh, curating uh, things for uh, stories for film. Um, thank you all for the compliments. Thank you again, Dr. Parker, for being here. Go ahead, Meryl. Go ahead, Meryl.
just want to quickly say shout out to Donye for doing some engineering tonight. So yeah, yeah. of course, the, the coolest man in the room. Don, <laughs> couldn't right. see you. That's why. I did, I, yeah, you you've been there so cool tonight. I missed you, man. <laughs> thanks again. Thank you all. Appreciate everyone showing up. Take care, um, Angelica. Thanks for a great flyer, Angelica. Got to get your flowers too. Thank you all. Y'all have a wonderful evening. All right. Take care, everybody.